Hey, uh, why don't you get your Bible ready? We're going into the Word of God. Whether you're ready or not, here we come. We are opening the Bible every Sunday. It's what we do, and we always want to look to Jesus. The whole book's about Him. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Everything in this Bible has a big arrow from beginning to end pointing to Jesus. Uh, today we are talking about marriage and talking about romantic relationships. So, um... I don't want you to think that's something separate from Jesus, though. Jesus, if you're a Christian, he finds his way into everything. He doesn't want to be separate from you when you're driving, or from when you're working, from when you're playing, from when you're working out. If you're single, if you're married, if you're divorced, if you're dating, he wants to be in everything, everything you do. So... We've titled this series The Poetic and the Practical because this is Hebrew poetry. Might not be the best place to springboard and teach practical principles for your romantic relationships, but I don't know. Sometimes the Bible tells you really clearly what to do. Sometimes it shows you what to do. And that's more what we see in this love story. We see a beautiful romance. It unfolds. It grows. It builds. It explodes. It's exploding. Um, and I think we want to pattern our lives off of all of God's ways. How many of you guys feel like you want every area of your life to be touched by God, blessed by God, look like Jesus, pattern after his word? That's what Christians do. There's a lot of um, different views on sexuality these days and masculinity and femininity and relationships. There's tons of views coming at you. It's pretty strong if you're a young person coming from educational systems. Um, the government wants to get involved and try to say how these things work. And for Christians, we always do the same thing. We trust God. We trust Jesus. We trust God's word. And the more we trust him, the more he blesses us. Whatever surrender to him, he can bless. I'm telling you, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for us. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. As we open it today, we pray our hearts would be soft. We pray we wouldn't resist you. And your goodness to us. May we all swallow the pills that are hard to swallow, knowing that everything you've written for us is for our good and is for your glory. May we not resist you or think anything you say is outdated, but may we trust that your words and your ways are transcendent. Help us to take away uh, transcendent principles. Help us to also take away hope and faith today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so open your Bible if you got one. Otherwise, listen along. We're in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and this is actually part 4 of the series. The woman, she starts. She says, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. The man speaks now. He says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Now the woman speaks. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade I took great delight and sat down. In his... His fruit was sweet to my taste. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Sustain me with raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, because I'm lovesick. Let his left hand be under my head, and his right hand embrace me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelle, or by the hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases Listen, my beloved, behold, he is coming, climbing on the mountains, leaping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he's standing by our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's peering through the lattice. My beloved responded and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines, and the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree has ripened its figs, and the vines and blossom have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep path, let me see your form, let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet, and your form is lovely. The woman speaks here. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards, while our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies, until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away. 
Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle, or a young stag on the mountains of Bether. <coughs> All right, how many of you guys enjoyed that Hebrew poetry? A couple thousand, few thousand years old, still enjoyable, huh? Any romantics at heart in here? Just got a little bit of chills a couple times? Uh, it's all right. You can enjoy the Bible. It is all good. The whole thing, through and through. Even Song of Solomon. Even this steamy, romantic, should we say sexy, part of the Bible. Uh, I've told you this before. Um, sex is not something Hollywood made up. It's not something devil made up. It's something God made up. It's in the beginning pages of the Bible. God made man. Man is good. God made female, made woman, male and female, both good. God made a marriage. There was a wedding in the garden. The Bible says they were joined together and naked and not ashamed. This is a gift from God. And everything God makes that is good and that's for us to enjoy, Satan wants to attack, wants to counterfeit, and wants to just try to destroy us through it, divert our trust away from God. This beautiful uh, love story in Song of Solomon shows us, though, the beauty of doing things the right way, doing things God's way. How many of you guys want that for people that you love? You want them to experience the blessing of doing things God's way. You don't want them to have to learn everything through the school of hard knocks. I mean, some of you might be like me, and you like to learn a few lessons the hard way. Sometimes we're a bonehead. But most of the time, I think we want, we want the shortcut to success, and that's what God's Word wants to help us do. So we're going to go through this today and talk a little bit about what the verses mean, and then we're going to springboard to practical principles. And you might be saying, hey, I don't want any, I don't want to work on my marriage right now, pastor. I don't, I, I'm not in that place. That was a few years ago. We're just coasting right now. Please leave me alone. That's fine. You can just assume this is for the person next to you. You might also be uh, single and happy. Like, I don't want a relationship. Been there, done that. Not going back to that. You can't bribe me to try to get back. This is not how it was in my life, Pastor. That is not what our words sounded like on a Sunday morning. No siree. That is not the way our relationship looked. And I get that too. And uh, hopefully you can hopefully you can continue to heal in the season you're in as you get in this book. Maybe uh, you're single and you are dying to be in a relationship. You think that is the answer to all of your problems. I'm glad that we can raise our hands in this room and tell you marriage is wonderful. Oh, I'm a happily married man, but I don't think it's the answer to all of your problems. I really don't. I'd, I'd be lying if I said that, as much as I enjoy marriage. Jesus, Jesus is what our heart craves. And I, I've told you this before. Uh, no one on the earth is your soulmate. The Bible really teaches that first and foremost, Jesus is our soulmate, first and foremost. But I, I still love the concept of soulmates. I'm not going to lie. I think I found mine. All right. Anyways, <laughs> let's jump into chapter two. So she starts off and she says, I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. What is she talking about? It's funny because last chapter she was talking about some of her insecurity. You guys remember that? She's complaining that her skin's too tan. She's like, dang it. I sat in that suntan booth too long. No, actually she was saying my brothers made me work out in the fields and all these little rich girls kept their skin all nice and pale. And here I am in a culture that wants pale skin and I got dark skin. She said, I'm swarthy. She said, don't stare at me. She's a little insecure. She's got a little bit of body image stuff going. That's all right. Because she's the only woman who's ever dealt with that in the history of the world, right? Am I right? And women are the only ones that deal with that too, right, man? Am I too? <laughs> Every man I talk to, either he's either underweight, trying to gain weight, or overweight, trying to gain weight. No man's ever told me. Very rarely that he's, you know, just the right way. It is funny. Same, same with the, it's the human condition. Sometimes we just aren't thankful for how we are. And she had that going. But he, he kind of talked her through it. And he kept giving her these verbal affirmations and compliments and assuring her through his words that he is altogether pleasantly uh, thrilled, happy with, accepting of his romantic partner. And it seems like by chapter two, She's got a different uh, note to her, her song. She's saying a different tune. She's got a different script she's reading. She's saying, you know what? I might not be the most exotic flower in the palace garden, but I'm a beautiful wildflower. There might be a lot of pretty flowers, but I'm one of them. That's what she says here. That's the Rose of Sharon. That's the Lily of the Valleys. She's not saying all other women are ugly. And finally, I rose to the top and beat them all from the top place. And I'm number one. She's not saying that. She's saying, I own it. I'm beautiful. I'm a woman of beauty, and there's a lot of beautiful women, but I'm one of them. 
she's saying that. How many of you guys think that's really neat to see? How many of you guys think that's beautiful when someone knows who they are and can own it and say, I'm beautiful, I love the way I'm made? I've said this before, I think this is an original quote, so you can quote me and put my name next to it. I think the most beautiful thing on the planet is a Christian who knows who they are. I do, and I know that might not be the essence of what this verse is about, so maybe you could say confidence is sexy. I don't know what you want to do with this, but I definitely think there's something really powerful happening in this maturing woman and in this maturing relationship. So next, the man chimes in, and what does he say? Oh, actually, I wanted to give you some, and I don't want to chime in too soon. I want to give you some practical principles. You guys ready? Can we make this practical? Because I'm telling you, there's someone on this planet you're going to run into someday who has a little bit of body image stuff going, a little bit of image issues. Might not be in this room, but there's someday you're going to run into someone who's thinking about, am I beautiful? Am I attractive? Am I desirable? Someone's going to be thinking that. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe they're going to have that going someday. Maybe it's a teenager. Maybe you have a nephew or a niece. Who knows? Maybe it'll be you. Here's what I wanted to say. Positive body image and confidence is extremely helpful for romantic relationships and enhances sensuality and sexuality. Confidence is sexy. I know it's church, but I gotta teach you the Bible. I can't find a way around it. I really believe this. All right, let me give you some more practical principles. I don't wanna explain that yet. Let me give you some more. Pod positive body image for the Christian comes first from accepting your identity from God. It does. I'll tell you what. There's no amount of billions of dollars you can spend on cosmetics. There's no hours you can spend in the gym. There's no slander you can talk about. Ugly them, ugly that. Look at me. I'm better shaped than them. There's none of that that can really do it for you. But man, you come to know who you are in Christ. That solves a lot of problems. That really does. Accept your identity from God. That's pr primarily where the Christian gets positive body image from. However, it's greatly helped in romantic relationships through validation that is both verbal and physical from your spouse. So this is a word to the married people and to anyone who wants to be married someday. Remember that your words have great power and validation is a human need. Men need it, women need it. Just because they look happy doesn't mean they don't still need validation. Just because they're a Christian doesn't mean they don't still need validation from their spouse. If you got kids, you can provide validation they need. At my house, I'm... Uh, I am pretty careful about some things, but if you were to watch me, you'd probably think I'm pretty careless about other things. I get neighbors knocking on my door sometimes, telling me there's too many sharp tools around my yard, and they don't like my kids having saws and knives, and I don't know, I get the park rangers telling me I'm not keeping a close eye on my kids. So I admit it, sometimes I'm probably not careful enough, okay? I get it. The granny's yelling at me in the grocery store. Sometimes I like my kids to learn things. I'll tell you, there are some things I'm very careful about. One thing is any words that could promote negative body image around my kids. I don't like people talking about weight around kids. I don't like kids labeling. I don't like adults labeling kids stocky, heavy, big bones, skinny. I don't tolerate any of that. I don't think kids need that. I think kids are just born with this healthy sense of I like the way I'm made until they get negativity until they start hearing negative things about it from their peers, from school, from the movies, from TV. So I'm just really careful about that. But back to romantic relationships, you know, sometimes you got the past to deal with, but how many of you guys know a lot of times we deal with the past by stewarding the present? So if you're in a romantic relationship, I just wanna tell you, you can really help your spouse with strategic, intentional, deliberate affirmation and validation, and it goes both ways. Man, if you're uncomfortable with that, you can tell your woman you like it. You, you don't have to just wonder if she'll ever say it and look for it in uh, negative outlets. You can ask for it from your wife. Women, you can ask for it from your husband. I've, obviously, we can be obsessive and go too far. Tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me I'm beautiful. I realize we can go too far. I'm still saying this is a God-given thing. All right. Next practical principle. Unhealthy comparison is not needed to achieve positive body image and confidence. Amen. So I just love this. At first, she is comparing herself to the other ladies, and it ain't helping her. She's saying, they're all pale, and look at me. I'm dark and swarthy. Don't stare at me. And I'm just going to tell you, there's no way that comparison, unhealthy comparison, helps you get to where you need to get. 
Sometimes if you do it and say you go overboard and you really get there, guess what? It'll just take you to arrogant and conceited. It never really helps you get to contentment. Unhealthy comparison is not needed. She gets that. I don't really think that's the illustration. She says, I'm a lily of the valley, a rose of Sharon. She's not saying I'm the only flower, I'm the best flower. She says, I'm a beautiful wildflower. I don't know, I like that. I love that content attitude she has. I think that's really healthy for her personally and very helpful for her romantic relationship. All right, I want to, man, I'm getting practical with you guys because sometimes people don't talk about this stuff in church, but they come and talk to me about it later and they want to know the answers and they get stuck on stuff. So I'm going to tell you this. You want to talk about exercise for a minute? Here's what I believe. The Christian's primary motivation for exercise is stewardship and health not body image issues. You want to exercise, help yourself. But if you're a Christian, exercise is not so you feel better about who you are. Exercise is to steward the gift of your physical body so you can be strong and you can serve God as long as you can, as well as you can, in any way he needs you to. Men can do that, women can do that. I want you all to live a long, healthy, happy life. I don't want to bury you when you're young. I want to be at your graveside and on the hospital bed when you're old and you've lived a strong, vibrant, vigorous life for Jesus Christ. I think exercise can absolutely be a part of that. I don't think exercise is just so we can look in the mirror and shame ourselves into some kind of body image arrival. I don't believe in that for the Christian. It might have worked in your old life. It doesn't work anymore. You're a Christian now. You accept what God says about you. What does God say about you? Well, what does uh, Solomon's daddy say in the scriptures? King Solomon, the guy penning all this, a lot of this, uh, speaking these healthy body validations to his wife. I wonder where he got this idea that the body is a, is a gift from God. Maybe he got it from his dad. Who was his dad? His dad was King David. His dad penned some of the Psalms. Let me read one I copy pasted for you this morning. It's from Psalm Night 139, he said, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Just going to pause real quick and say, there was a guy one time that tried to uh, body shame this guy. I don't know if you remember him. He was really tall. He said, you're a little coward. You're a little dog. You're tiny. You ain't a warrior. I'm going to eat you for my breakfast. You know what happened to that guy? Didn't go well for him. <laughs> this is a man who knows who he is. I told you, it's the most attractive, beautiful thing on the planet. He's a Christian who knows who they are. I, and he says, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is some of them. Whether you're married or single, you need to know how crazy God is about you. You need to know how absolutely delighted he is in every part of you. That he designed you in a fearfully and wonderfully and wonderful way. That's where Christians get that from. Not from the gym, not from the lotion. Primarily from God. No, no hating on the gym or the lotion. All right, not shaming that either. So now I want to tell you, negative statements about your romantic, romantic partner's body are never helpful. I really believe that. You can call this opinion, but I really believe it. You don't need to ever say a negative comment about your partner's body. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's helpful. And I never had a woman come to me or a man come to me and say, I love when my spouse shames me and just wants me to do this and do that and get more of this and get more of that. Never had a spouse come to me. I've had spouses of both male and female come to me and say, I'm not liking what I'm hearing from my spouse, but never had, a, never had it the other way around. So if you want to help your spouse be healthy, create a healthy culture in your home, eliminate things like sugar, get outside and enjoy the outdoors like they're doing here, but we don't want to shame people. So I'm going to teach you more. I'm going to teach you more about this. I know this is a touchy issue. I know our culture has warped our view on this stuff. So I want the word of God. Let's go on. So verse two. The man speaks up. He says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. So he took her little metaphor and he took it further. He said, no, no, you're not just a wildflower among wildflowers. You're a wildflower among thorns. He said, that's who you are among the other women. So 
she's doing it healthy in her own way by not hating on other women, but he's doing it kind of a healthy way by hating on other women. What's that about? I don't know, I kind of like it. I kind of think it's helpful to make your romantic partner the number one in your heart and in your eyes and in your brain and in your life. I think it's helpful, I think it's healthy, I think it's possible, I think it's realistic if you're a Christian. I uh, read this book, Mark Driscoll, and he, he has this quote that I really like, that your spouse is your standard of beauty. If your spouse is tall, you're into tall. If your spouse is short, you're into short. If your spouse is 22, you're into 22. If your spouse is 82, you're into 82. Your spouse is your standard of beauty. As that changes, so does your appetite for the attractiveness of your spouse. <clears throat> There's some comparison that's healthy. There's some comparison that is unhealthy, unhelpful, and unnecessary. And he says, you are my number one. You're the lily among thorns. That's my darling among the maidens. It's kind of a healthy celebration, a healthy comparison, I think. I don't know. I, I, I grew up pretty involved in, in church, and I'm thankful for that, positive influences. I also grew up around a lot of not church stuff. I remember being at a lot of situations with guys and girls and their boyfriends and their girlfriends. And I always thought it was weird. I always thought it weird, as was weird how guys would talk about other women around their romantic partner. I like that actress. They're watching football. I like that cheerleader. A woman walks by. I like that woman. Does anyone think that's weird or is it just me? Because it was very common when I was growing up. I think it's a little... I don't, oh man, I don't really understand the games that people play. I've done very little dating. I have very little game. Thank God I'm not single. Uh, I beat the odds and I got a woman to marry me. And I had no class, no game. I did not know how to play dating games. But I think that's manipulation. I kind of do. I kind of think when a guy has to talk about another woman when he's in a romantic relationship, I think it's insecure. I think it's manipulation. I think it's some weird, weird way to stay on top. I don't even fully understand it. I don't even know if I want to understand it. I'm just going to say to all us men, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary. Once you're in a relationship with a woman, she's your woman. She's your only woman. I don't think you need to look around. I don't think you need to mention it. I was like, I I'm serious. I've watched movies and guys mention actresses in front of their wife. I'm like, what? I don't, I don't get that. What's, does that have any value? Can someone stand up and argue with me and <laughs> tell me I'm wrong? I just don't get it. So don't do it. You don't need to. Your spouse is your standard of attractiveness. Here's a point. Healthy comparison is expressed through verbal affirmation of one's preference for their spouse. I think your spouse needs to know you prefer them. Okay, now I want to teach you a little bit more. You say, well, what if we are kind of losing the spark? I hear this a lot, and I don't agree with it. What if we're losing chemistry? What if we're just not compatible? What if we're falling out of love? I've heard all those before and I don't believe in any of that. I believe people grow apart. I believe people have habits that create disconnect and separation and they're not helpful. I don't believe in all that other stuff. Here's what I believe. Attraction is a feeling and an appetite. We get to choose how we feed this appetite. We're in a culture today that believes any sexual appetite you have is healthy, good, right, and something to be proud of. Christians don't believe that. Christians believe we have tons of feelings, tons of appetites. We don't shame people for those. But we, if we trust in Jesus, we feed the appetites he tells us to. If you're married, he tells you to feed the appetite for your spouse. Feed that thing. Um, one of my favorite doctors, Joe DeBruin, he says, he loves to say, pour it all into the marriage. He says it all the time. Well, what if you're just, you've got a very high desire for intimacy and validation and sex? He says, pour it all into the marriage. So I'm talking to married people right now. Feed that appetite. Feed that appetite. It's a good appetite. Christians don't need to be ashamed of that. Sadly, sometimes people get the wrong message in Christian conservative circles that sex is something to be ashamed of. Sometimes people go into marriage, sadly, and have a little bit of that still residue from whatever Satan, whatever way Satan tried to attack that. No, it's a healthy and a good appetite, and God made it, and you feed it within the marriage. 
you feed it. You pour it all into the marriage. That is the one place. It's the outlet for all of these for all of these things that we're talking about. So I, I try to say this differently. Here's my next practical principles. Married partners get to feast on the attractiveness of their spouse. No one else's attractiveness is relevant or edifying. How many guys agree with me? Put your hand up. It's just not relevant. It doesn't mean you need to tell your wife every other girl is ugly. You don't have to lie. You don't need to tell your man every man is disgusting except for you. You don't have to lie. You just have to realize there's a point where it's not even helpful or relevant or edifying to talk about it anymore. They don't need to know about your ex. They probably don't. That's probably over and done with. All right. But let's talk to single people. Here's what I wrote. Let me read it before I say it out loud and make sure I agree with it. <laughs> okay. Attraction is healthy for a single person. So I just want you to know that. It's not like attraction suddenly, surprise shows up when you're married. No, we realize it's in your brain. It's attraction, it's healthy for a single person. Lust is not. So Christians, like I said, <laughs> we, we have this choice to feed appetites or to starve appetites that the Lord tells us not to. So Christian people, Christian single people accept attraction as healthy, but exercise restraint. You know, I realize I, I, there's a lot more I can say to single people in this, but I would prefer to do it one-on-one, -on -one, not in a sermon where I have to apologize to 100 emails. All right. But I definitely have this conversation with single people a lot. I think it's an important conversation to have. What do I do with all this desire? Let's talk. All right, but let's not talk about it right here. Verse three. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade, I took great delight and sat down. His fruit was sweet to my taste. So what she's saying, she is saying she enjoys him. She enjoys his presence, his closeness. She enjoys his shade and takes delight in it. That there is a pleasant and refreshing taste. Some people think this is sexual. I personally don't. Most of the commentators I read believe that they're... Uh, how do you say it horny in a Christian church appropriate way? I don't know a better way to say it. They are bursting with desire for each other. But I don't believe they've been sexual together yet at this point in the song. That's my personal opinion. Some people think this is a series of flashbacks to different parts of their relationship. I think they're engaged and really excited to be together. And it's beautiful, pure, and healthy. Um, so I don't think they're sexual yet. I think they are in their head, not with their physical bodies. That's why I should have said it. So I think what she's saying here is not sexual. I think she's saying I am experiencing his covering. Maybe you think I'm over-spiritualizing this, but I can show you a lot of Bible verses that do talk about in marriage, there is a reality of a man bringing covering to his woman, a spiritual covering. And that a woman, if this is done right, it provides a pleasantness, it's refreshing, it's liberating, it's protective, um, it brings blessing, it's not for control. So I realize some of us maybe have learned about a man's covering, a Christian man's covering in marriage the wrong way, it is not for control. It doesn't give you 51% voting power, it doesn't give you authority to demand, it does give you responsibility to lead, and it does teach women in marriage that there is a greater blessing that you'll experience when you do what the Bible says, submit to that covering, to that responsibility. Doesn't mean he always gets his way. Absolutely not. Doesn't mean you can't say no. Doesn't mean there's not boundaries. It means there is a attitude, a humble attitude of submissiveness that blesses the marriage covenant. The woman takes a submissive role or, or mindset. The man takes a leadership mindset. Doesn't mean the women don't also lead. It means in marriage... The men provide this spiritual covering. Yes, we believe that in church. Yes, the Bible teaches that. I believe she's starting to experience that here. I've talked to women before when they're dating a man, when they're engaged to a man, and they already experience it, that they are coming under his spiritual authority and under his covering. It's beautiful. It's healthy. It's normal. You say, no, it should happen on the wedding night. I don't, that's not been my experience. I've seen lots of times a woman starts separating emotionally from her family or from her independence 
and started to come under that man's spiritual leadership. It's a beautiful thing. I believe she's experiencing that in this relationship at this point. Practical principle. The Christian husband covers his wife in spiritual covering. If done correctly, this provides protection, refreshment, blessing, and delight. Let's move on. She speaks. He's brought me to his banquet hall. His banner over me is love. Literally, this actually is translated house of wine. Again, I think she's talking about this intoxicating feeling she has. We see that in the next verse. She's lovesick, she's going to say. Um, kind of like if you drink too much wine and you feel sick in your head, she's saying that's how I feel on his love. And she's saying his banner over me is love. So I want you to know this, that there's something really powerful in the way we publicly demonstrate love for your romantic partner. Um, <clears throat> she here is not, um, how do I say this? Sometimes, I don't understand this either. I told you, I wasn't in the dating uh, game, the dating world long enough to understand some things. Can anyone tell me why do sometimes guys want to keep the relationship on the down low so stinking long? Have you ever seen this before? Where women are like, please, can we tell people we're dating? It's been 16 years. And she's like, no, just keep it. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't put it on the internet. Don't hold my hand in public. Let's just play it on the down low. Let's not get too formal. I don't know if it's because sometimes people have commitment issues. I don't know if because he wants her to just to kind of like keep her in that manipulative, desperate. I do not understand. All I know is here, this guy is public about his love. And she says, it's like a banner. You know, they don't have uh, electronic billboards, but they could wave a banner like a billboard to give people direction. Sometimes in the military, they wave a banner. She's saying, his banner over me is love. He's public about his love for her, and she likes it. And it gives her a greater sense of security. And greater security gives, it's going to give her a greater freedom for all the wonderful things that happen in marriage. Publicly declaring one's romantic love increases feelings of security, and yes, security enhances sexuality. Okay, I want to tell you this too. Speak honorably about your romantic partner. Avoid marital slander and public criticism. So I, I got to be careful here because I, I love when people have the courage to uh, expose themselves. And especially, I think we all know, we should all know this, that marriage takes work and nobody's marriage is perfect. If you don't, if you, I hope that you know that in this church, it is okay to have problems. And we want people to feel like shame free, like, hey, we're all in this together. We don't want gossip. We don't want slander. We don't want judging. We don't want shaming. You can be having the worst time of your life in marriage right now, but we want, we don't want you to keep that a secret. We don't want you, the devil to isolate you. So absolutely, we want people to be able to talk about their relationship and the problems they're having. Probably not on the microphone in the front of the church, but in a safe venue with people who are equipped to help you. Absolutely, we want that for you. If you're a woman, if you're a man, if you've been married for a long time, if you're newly married, even if you're in some type of leadership or ministry, we don't want you thinking you're an exception, you have to be perfect. That is so from the devil, it's not true. That being said, I think speaking honorably about one's romantic partner is, it has to be a constant in marriage. I really do. Like I, I realize when you're working things out behind closed doors, sometimes things get a little messy in the moment. I think though in public, there should just be this code that we honor our spouse Amen. in public. I just think that's helpful. I realize you can sometimes make a little joke, a little quip, and it's innocent, but the line is very fine and it's very easy to cross and it inhibits freedom in that relationship. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. It makes people feel less secure, less loved, and less able to express their romance. So she's saying his banner over me is love. Then she says, sustain me with raisin cakes, but fresh with apples. I am lovesick. She is just on cloud nine. Her, her head is out in the clouds. And she, verse six, is fantasizing about him again. She said, let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. That is everything I've read and heard from other commentators is that is a sexual fantasy. She is excited for him not just to be talking about her to his buddies, but to be enjoying her in the privacy of their chambers. She is excited. And like I told you in former weeks, fantasizing about your spouse if you're married is healthy and good. 
If you're engaged, it's natural, it's common, it's normal. All right, there's nothing wrong with that. Verse seven, this is a great verse. Let's talk about this. She, she says, I assure you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or hinds of the field, that you do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. So she is turning here and giving this advice to the young ladies. She's saying, don't fall in love too soon. She's saying, do not let this fire get out of hand too soon. Wait till the right time. And this could apply to young men as well. It's not just for the young ladies. But Christians believe this, that romance is not just finding the right person. It's being the right person, finding the right person, and doing it in the right timing. So the right person at the wrong time is the wrong person. So it's the right person, you be the right person in God's timing. And she's saying there is a time for everything. There's a time for this love and you need to wait until the right time because this thing is meant to grow and build and explode. And you don't want to open this can too soon. And this is something we should talk about with kids. And this is something that we should talk about with teenagers. It's something single people should know that your, your feelings, your attraction, this is all normal and healthy, but there is a level of self-restraint that God wants to help you with so that this thing can be without shame and without destruction and without headache and without heartache. I know we can't completely uh, guard over all heartache. I shouldn't say that. Like That's, never, that's completely avoidable, but a lot of it is preventable. All right, let's move on. Are you guys having fun? I'm having fun. I'm talking to you what? You guys look so comfortable. I love it. All right. Is the heater on or is that just your guys' body temperature? I don't know. Verse 8. Now she is excited. How many of you guys know what season it is in this poem? Anyone know what season it is? Spring. Spring. Very good. It's the springtime. I don't think it outright said that, but he's she is describing spring. She or he. Uh... So she's excited. She sees him pursuing her, looking through the lattice, knocking on her door, standing behind the wall. She has these nicknames for him. She says he's like a gazelle or a young stag. He's excited. He's strong. She's saying some good, validating, affirming things. And he's asking her on a date. He doesn't show up, you know, in a car, beep the horn, because that's not how it is. He probably shows up on a horse. And... You know, there's no doorbell. So he's speaking through and hollering at her. Hey, it's the springtime. He's saying flowers are showing up. I think we should go and hear the turtle doves cooing, making their noise. There's some ripe figs I saw on a tree down the path. Um, vines going off. There's grapes. They're beautiful. They smell fragrant. Time for a date. Let's go. He's essentially saying that. She's excited. He is pursuing her. I told you this in previous lessons that some of these things that work during dating still work during marriage. Yep, I want you to know that. Pursuing your spouse for a date still works. Work during dating, it still works during marriage. Um, like I told you, people I don't believe people fall out of love. I do think they grow apart though and they stop investing in the relationship, sadly. So he is all about it. And verse 14 he said, he calls her, he says, oh, my dove in the clefts of the rock. He says, let me see your form. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your form is lovely. So I kind of get this idea that he is wanting to explore more deeply the entirety of who she is. There's some physical here, but when he calls her the dove, he was referring earlier to her eyes. Uh, he wants to hear her voice. He wants to have conversation. He wants to grow in the relationship. He wants to investigate more deeply who she is. It's a really beautiful way to pursue someone. They say never stop learning about who someone is. I see that here. Um, but she she doesn't say, okay. She doesn't get in the get on the horse and say, take me away, honey. She says something interesting. She says, catch the foxes for us. The little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. So this is an interesting statement. What's she talking about? Why is she 
he's the king. Why is she trying to make him go do some manual labor and catch foxes in the vineyard? Can't he have a servant do that? So this is probably metaphorical for problems. And like I told you, people like me and you, we don't have problems in our marriage and in our relationship. But back then, sometimes people have problems. And sometimes people, even when they're dating, problems start to surface. And she wants to talk about it. He wants to go on a date. He wants to maybe be a little physical. Hopefully not too much, because they're not married yet. They have some restraint. But he wants to be together. And she says, I want to talk. I wonder how many romantic relationships have ever gotten into that same predicament. Quit smiling, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> to me, you're smiling at me right now. Where one person says, I'm ready to have some fun. Maybe go on a date. Maybe be intimate. Maybe watch a movie. Another person's saying... Uh-uh, I want to have that conversation. I want to address that problem. I want to talk. And maybe one spouse is oblivious, or maybe one spouse is very uh, in tune with that, is just avoiding the conversation. I'm not going to say Solomon's avoiding the conversation. I don't even know if this caught him off guard. I'm just going to tell you that she wants to talk about some problems. And that's what she's referring to with the little foxes rooting the vineyards. So let me tell you about this foxes. Not only could nibble the grapes, which are the fruit of the vineyard, the fruit of the relationship, the foxes could also chew on the vines. What happens if you chew up the vines? You have no harvest. You have no relationship. I think this is really a neat metaphor for people who want to succeed in their romantic relationships. Now, there are some problems that maybe we perceive as small problems, but maybe if not addressed and nipped in the bud, can cut off the life of the relationship. I mean, you guys think that's true. Some problems look really small sometimes. They look insignificant. They look like, oh, that's just him. Oh, that's just her. Oh, that's just me. That's just my personality, just accept it. Well, my, my rule of thumb is if one spouse wants to talk about it, then we both talk about it. Let me talk about this a little bit. Let me some practical principles. I want to tell you this, first of all, in the context of marriage. Marriage is work, but it is good and profitable work. Decide beforehand and along the way to embrace the work of marriage. The payoff is more than worth it. I can't believe it. Sometimes they try to teach you and tell you that. I hear people say this to me. They believe it with all their heart. They say, Josh, if you find the right person, marriage is not going to be work. It's going to be easy. I have people tell me this. I can't believe they say that. They don't know. They don't know. If you just find the right person, marriage won't be work. Oh my gosh, what a lie. How much nonsense can you believe? What Hollywood nonsense have you been drinking? <laughs> marriage is work, but it's good and profitable work. Decide beforehand along the way to embrace the work of marriage. I think that's true for every relationship. How many of you guys have a, a deep, rich, long friendship and you never had a fight before? I don't believe it. I don't believe you. The reason your friendships are deep it's because you worked through some things together. You hit some hills and you climbed them together. You didn't abandon shit. You didn't fight, flight, or freeze. Maybe you did. Maybe you did one of those. But you worked, you came together. You reconciled. You worked through it. Come on, everyone should know that the richest relationships are the ones where there's been the most work. Don't believe Hollywood. Don't believe the devil. I'll tell you that it's true for every relationship, especially relationship, marriage. All right. Let me talk to you about something else. Dating should include deep, difficult, and courageous conversations, not just fun and games. Oh, well, you know that. I'm, I'm not a... Yeah. Like I said, I don't know a lot about dating. I don't have a lot of experience. I think I, I dated one person, and we dated for like less than like eight months. So I don't have a lot of experience. So if you don't want me to give you dating advice, you know, I'm sorry. I still tend to give dating advice. <laughs> but... I'm just going to tell you, have some hard conversations. This happens. People get dating, and then they get a little, I don't know what it is, cold feet about having hard talks. You know, sometimes people say, well, we haven't talked about God yet. Take my microphone off for a second. You, you're a Christian. You come to church. You read your Bible. You're a vibrant Christian. You've been on a few dates, and you've not talked about God yet. Talk, bring it up next time. Bring it up next time. Go ahead and break the ice. <laughs> well, I guess it wasn't on your profile either. <laughs> you know what? Maybe talk about it on your first date. Have some courageous conversations. All right, let me tell you something else. 
This is what this is one of many many reasons why Christians believe that um, marriage is when we covenantally join together. We don't just consummate through sexual and physical intimacy. We, we we bring our whole life together. I really believe that you bring all of your assets together. You bring. I believe you bring your debt together, your finances together, your habits together, your persons together. If you got a dog, it's both your dog now. If you got a cat, it's both your cat. Maybe that's my opinion, but I really believe there's just this complete covenantal joining when you get married. You, the Bible says you're one flesh. Yeah, you're still two people. But here's what happens in our culture is we, pra- we don't practice commitment. We don't practice commitment. We practice keeping the back door open. So what we do is cohabitation, fornication, uh, shacking up, and doing some version of joining our lives together but not making a marital covenant. The devil is all over that, and I'm not shaming you if that's what you did or that's what you're doing. I'm not. I realize that just might be where you're at. But I'm just saying, it makes it hard to do the work. It makes it hard to do the work when you do it outside of God's timeline. You should do some hard work when you're dating, and you should keep sex separate for your own good so you can do the work you need to do. This happens all the time. People tell me this. They get in a relationship, it gets physical, and then their brain and the thoughts are really hard to differentiate, and it gets hard to really have the hard conversations. It gets hard to make hard decisions. That's why, that's why God wants this blessing of sexuality to be fully opened up and used in the context of marital covenant. Do the hard work during dating. Have the hard talks. All right, let's move on. Um, I want to tell you, work on the marriage together and don't be defensive. Uh, I hear this a lot. It's uh, someone wants to work on the marriage and sometimes the other person is not as excited to have those conversations. And I just want to encourage you, whoever's listening today, even if you're you're saying, well, you don't know what it's like to be married to my spouse. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to your spouse right now. Don't be defensive. Be willing to go there. Even if they come off a little harsh, be willing to go there when your spouse wants to talk about a fox in the vineyard. If you're dating, be willing to go there. Oh, why, do we, why are you always upset? Why is it always drama? Can you ever be happy? Can you ever be thankful? Don't say that stuff. If they want to talk about a fox in the vineyard, it's because they care about you and the relationship. All right, I want to tell you this too. Your marriage and your spouse has problems, but your spouse is not the problem. (coughs) Your spouse has problems. Your spouse is not the problem. Remember that. I want you to know this too. Your marriage has an enemy. Your spouse is not the enemy. In the heat of things, I'll tell you what, you might, you might be amening and saying, yeah, Josh, we know that. But in the heat of things, this is not the way people think. This is not the, this is not the script. The devil feeds you when there's conflict. He tells you your spouse is the problem. You're the problem. No, the marriage has problems, and we deal with them together. All right. Well, we are getting to our, towards the end. So... It appears they work on the relationship. She chimes in. She says, my beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. She's enjoying this feeling of belonging. It's a very wonderful human need for belonging. Obviously, Christians believe we find that first and foremost from Jesus Christ. He he gives us belonging in, in him, in his family, in right standing relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. In God's kingdom, in God's church, we have belonging. However, in marriage, we also experience another tier of belonging. She feels belonging. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, it's not good for a man, single man, to have sexual relationships with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relationships with his own wife, each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. Likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent, and for a time you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. She's experiencing this changing in the relationship. The relationship is maturing. She's saying, I'm not 
my own independent girl power, me too, sorry, that's the wrong statement. Girl power, um, my body, my choice, that's not who I am anymore. She says, I'm a, I'm a follower of God and I'm in a romantic relationship. And God is part of my relationship. And the Bible says, husband, my body is not just my own, it belongs to the Lord. It also tells me in marriage, belongs to my husband. Same for the husband. My body's not my own. It belongs to my wife. I know our culture hates this. I know our culture attacks this, but this is actually not to control and suppress people. It's to actually empower the greatest level of enjoyment and pleasure through serving one another, a mindset of serving my spouse through my love, through intimacy. All right. And then the last verse, uh, she is... Again, I think she's expressing sexual desire for her husband, her, for her fiance. She talks about a young stag on the mountains of Bether. From what I've heard, there's no such thing as mountains of Bether. Those are the mountains on her chest, and Bether is disconnection uh, or separation. She's probably saying, I'm envisioning him being with me, cool of the day, when the shadows flew away, all day, all night, laying on me. She is ready to be married, and that's what the next chapter is going to include, is their wedding. It's exciting, and it's pure, and it's something God made. It's not something we need to be ashamed of. Well, you did it, guys. We had another real conversation. We did it with this four walls called the church building around us. And hey, none of you, uh, I don't know, you did a great job. We're just excited for more of... The, the will of God expressed in your life. I'm telling you what, I just think every time we read this word, I want hope to come into your life. I don't care. I mean, I do care, but I don't care about your past. I don't even care about yesterday. All I care about is today and tomorrow. His mercies are new every day. Some of you have a beautiful testimony that Satan tried to steal a lot from you. He tried to destroy you in some of these er- similar areas we're reading about. But God had another plan. And you said yes to him. Maybe you're in the season of saying yes before you see the, the, the restoration, the fulfillment. I love you, and as, as someone that you uh, trust to teach you the word of God, I want God's will for you in your life, in your singleness, or in your romantic relationships. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much. Father, thank you for your, your great love. It's not a little love, it's a great love. And you sacrificed your your body for us. You said your body is not your own. You sacrificed it for us so that we could have life, so that we could be never separated from love. So we wouldn't need to get all our needs met the way the world does, seeking them in empty holes, but that we could have our hearts filled with Jesus Christ himself. And Father, we thank you also that You've not only restored us to the Father through Jesus, but you restore us to one another through Jesus. You restore us to friends through Jesus. You restore us in family relationships through Jesus. You restore us in marriages through Jesus. God, we thank you that your heart is for connection. Your heart is for life. Your heart is for growth and for maturity. We thank you, God, that you don't stumble upon our mess our messes, our problems, our embarrassment. God, you don't get stuck there. Sometimes we we do, but you don't. God, we thank you that you're looking ahead and you're extending a hand for us to take and to walk with you. I just thank you for everyone today who's maybe maybe facing a difficult situation, saying, I don't know, Josh, my situation is difficult. I, I think it's harder than you think. I just thank you that, though that might be true, that we serve a God who moves mountains. We serve a God with whom nothing is impossible. We serve a God that heals the sick and raises the dead. We serve a God who turns difficult marriages into happy marriages. We thank you for the courage to talk about things. And I just pray for that courage for my friends today. The courage to find the right venues to talk about difficult problems in daily life. 